Hello, everybody. We will start in one or two minutes. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this EASPD webinar, Disability Services as Social Rights Enablers, which is part of our uh, week-long run of events uh, on the topic of social services. Um, first of all, um, uh, I will go through a bit the logistics of the uh, event uh, before introducing the agenda to you, and then we will start the show. Um, we have uh, quite a strong delegation from Georgia, uh, which I'd like to welcome everybody there. Uh, and therefore, we also have interpretation English to Georgian. And to access the interpretation, you just need to click the link at the bottom of your screen uh, called interpretation. And if you then select Georgian, you will have the uh, interpretation. And um, we also have closed captioning, um, which is then therefore speech to text translation. And for that, you also have to click on closed caption and then uh, show subtitles. Um, if that is not clear, please then contact uh, my colleague uh, Dimitri Kapapakosh, who you should see in the list of uh, speakers. Um, the event will be recorded and made available after the event. Um, the microphones will be muted to ensure the quality of the session. And therefore, if you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A button uh, in the control bar, bar at the bottom or use the chat box. Uh, we do prefer the use of the Q&A button in the control panel. Um, I think that's it for the logistics. So if my colleague could maybe switch to the agenda. So yes, we have, uh, this is the agenda that you can see. It's a bit small, so sorry for, for that. Uh, we will start with some welcoming remarks from Luke Sedori, the Secretary General of ESPD. And um, unfortunately, Mr. Pichlahu, who uh, a member of the European Parliament, is unable to join uh, today. But I'm very glad to announce that his head of cabinet, Mr. Bogdan Dilianu, will be uh, joining us and will manage to uh, welcome us. We will then have the keynote speech from Mr. Gerard uh, Quinn, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, before which we will present uh, ESPD's perspective on quite a few of the upcoming European Union social policy initiatives. After that, we will have three panel discussions and when we will conclude uh, around four o'clock with uh, some concluding remarks. And um, we'd like to make at the ESPD the, the events as interactive as possible. So again, although we can't um, bring you in as participants, as, as speakers to ask your questions, what we are able to do is to uh, use the chat box and the Q&A to therefore um, forward the um, questions to the relative uh, speakers. I can see that Mr. George, that that's it. does not see the option of Georgian translation. Uh, I think that is perhaps because you have not you do not have not downloaded the last version of the uh, Zoom. So if you want to have interpretation, please download the last version of the Zoom. Um, so that's it for the logistics and the agenda. We now have just under two hours to go through a quite a long uh, and interesting session. Um, I will first pass the floor to Luke Zeldalu, who will say some opening remarks on behalf of EASPD. Luke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, good afternoon.
to all of you, dear colleagues and partners uh, from across the European uh, continent. Uh, indeed, I'm Secretary General of uh, ESPD, and this is the opening event of a full week of activities that we organize, all activities that showcase, that bring innovative, in, uh, that bring information on innovative services that we are developing, thanks to the good cooperation with researchers and, of course, our member service providers from across uh, the continent. I think that uh, the title for the today's webinar is very well chosen. It is about disability services as social rights enablers. And in COVID-19 times, maybe more than before, we know now how essential support services are and what a crucial role they can play in allowing people to enjoy their social and their human rights. Indeed, quality services enable people with support needs to live the life they want to live. They empower people to enjoy their social and their human rights. And it is, I think, to a large extent. <laughs> developments that services became more aware of this enabling and empowering role. But still, there are many problems. The challenges are huge. And again, COVID-19 made it clear. We see a sector that is structurally uh, underfunded. We see staff shortages. We see lacks in terms of training and preparing uh, the, the people working in the services to deliver these empowering services. We see a lack of facilitating legal frameworks and, of course, an overall lack of recognition for the work done. The coming weeks and the coming months, many different important policy debates and policy developments are on the agenda of the European uh, institutions. We will further develop the European Disability Strategy. We will look at the implementation of the European pillar of social rights. We will discuss long-term care uh, services and we will discuss the child uh, guarantee. And I'm not just naming a few. Uh, there are more on the agenda than, than all this. And of course, we will also discuss the new budget. Uh, it is still under discussion. The new budget that should facilitate innovation and uh, indeed um, help us to implement these empowering uh, services. So this event is very timely. It is the right moment to have a discussion with the parliament. And I'm really happy and proud that so many MEPs um, express their willingness to uh, join us uh, today. It will not possible for all of them to join us in person, but we have a few video messages and we have some uh, MEPs that play key roles in uh, these uh, policy debates uh, here in Brussels. So we have the right people on the agenda and we have, I think, a fascinating uh, team on the agenda as well. What type of support service do we want in the future? What did we learn from the COVID-19? And how, how can we make sure that we step-by-step step move into the right direction? That is what we have on our agenda now. And that is uh, why I, with pleasure, hand over now to the uh, head of cabinet of uh, MEP uh, Dragos Pislaru, Mr. Uh, Bogdan Delianu. I hope that that is more or less uh, correct, uh, Bogdan. Uh, you have the floor to uh, set the scene for this debate. We are all yours. Thank you very much, Luke. And wow, quite the task ahead of me. Uh, I will hope to try to fill in with the big shoes. I have to, those are the shoes of Dragos Peslaru, who sent his apologies for not being able to be with you today. Unfortunately, uh, he had a little accident. He's recovering now. And also we had an electoral weekend in Romania, uh, which was not the easiest moment uh, to, to work. So now he's taking some time off screens completely uh, for the, the, the few days. Now, the topic is very, very dear to him. Dragos uh, is, as you know, uh, the co-rapporteur of the European Parliament for the Recovery and Resilience Facility, and that's the uh, 672.5 billion euro fund meant to help us get through and over uh, the COVID crisis um, 
when you were talking about money and budget and you know that's one of the the topics that Argos tried to introduce within that um, recovery fund uh, in the, his six pillar structure the, the social investment is definitely one of them uh, but also the next generation, because we also were mentioning the child guarantee. Uh, in the context of the next generation, Dragos is also the vice president of the intergroup for children um, and also heavily invested in the intergroup for disabilities. And in Romania, this sector for us is a very important one because actually the election we just ran for uh, yesterday, uh, this was one of our key engagements to develop uh, a healthcare, se a care sector, sector uh, a care industry in Romania to make it competitive and to use all the possible social innovation techniques, digital tools, uh, social vouchers, and many other topics which are heavily on the agenda of the event you have in front of you today. In, in, in a way, we, we feel that Romania has a competitive advantage. Uh, and I'm just going to talk about it because it's, it's in a way relevant to, to the discussion at hand, in that we have um, a lot wow. of care workers uh, 3,000 Romanian women live as um, work as live-in care, carers in Austria. Uh, they live in uh, Italy, in France, uh, in the UK, and so on and so forth. And they help out with uh, household tasks. They, they offer care to people with disabilities, to people um, with um, various uh, issues. Um, and Romania, therefore, we feel has a big skill set advantage in this sector and also may have a price advantage in this sector because uh, in the um, area of help for uh, the aging people population, we actually had the first uh, gerontology institute in, in history created in Romania. So we are trying to find the ways, the money as well, to get the skills, skilled people at home to develop more skills and then to create an area where the people who need assistance at home can have it transparently, easily, uh, digitally, you know, if possible. And at the same time, the people who offer this care uh, are well paid, are well treated, have representation rights, because I saw on your agenda, you also will, will talk about this issue, which by the way, for us is a big problem, you know, the worker cooperatives, by the way. Um, and, you know, and we, we get to a point where everybody wins. And as I say, the vision, but as Luke said very well, it's a very complex situation and we are quite far so far from where we want to get. Now, um, there's a lot of issues and I'm sure you will cover them. Uh, you know very well that the level of the EU, this is a key point because besides the big budget of the RRF that we're talking about, there's a lot of little and not so little initiatives and discussions that we're having, which are all pertinent to this topic. Uh, the action plan for the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights, the upcoming child guarantee in 2021, an action plan for the social economy. These are all things where each are going to be on the agenda of the EU policymakers in 2021, and you should be heavily invested in these discussions because each uh, of these files will have a sector for care and, and the care industry. Um, at the same time, I was talking about this pillar structure that we proposed for the RRF. That's very relevant because that's really what we are doing now. Um, we have trialogues every, every other day almost, it seems uh, we're dreaming about trialogues there. And we came up with this six pillar structure um uh, digital uh, environment of course you know uh but also and these are the very relevant um the social pillar uh and the next generation pillar and this is one of the things i really want to highlight because that's very very important for us um we are trying to say and we got the majority in the parliament supporting this saying that at least seven percent of this uh, rf big fund should be given to each of these pillars that means that no matter what member states want to spend from their allocated money, they should at least allocate this uh, to social, to investment in, health, in care industries, to investment in, in help for people with disability, accessibility, but at the same time in the next generation. That, by the way, I know it's a bit lateral to the topic today, but it's very important for us. We feel that you know half of the RF are, is going to be loans, not all of it is going to be grants. And the people who are going to pay for the bills here are going to be the youth and the children who in, in the future will have to repay these loans. So we feel we are really have to invest at, at most that we can for their uh, welfare, education, integration, households, uh, nutrition, education, so um, housing, 
uh, and, and so on. So that's one of the, the things we're actually heavily campaigning right now to try to convince member states to support this uh, at least 7% um, uh, allocation of the RRF facilities. Now, just a few last words um, on, on Romania, because I told you we just campaigned, we just finished an election uh, a few hours ago. I myself was in a polling station up until late in the morning. Um, and we have there a heavy have a um, heavy uh, social platform program, which I know might be a bit um, weird for a liberal party, but this is one of the topics we deeply feel about because we feel this is not only a, 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 the care industry um, sector should not only be good, you know, for for um, the, the people, but it can also produce revenue, it can produce value. It's something that is a win-win situation if we are managed to support it and uh, to develop it further. And we you know we want to increase the quality of life for these people. And I Talk, uh, talk at the beginning about the people from Romania who work abroad in Austria, Italy, and so on and so forth. And there we have big problems with representation. We have big problems not with working um, illegally. They all work illegally. But the fact is that a lot of them work in, let's say, in the gray zone because are lied to or abused or they uh, are um, used by third party employers. Um, who give them a special status, for example, Geverbe status in Austria, and they don't really have control of their working times, holidays, uh, um, social security uh, allocations, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of need for representation for these people, while at the same time, we really do not want to kill the industry on the country, we want to make it more streamlined, we want to make these people more easily um, able to get in touch with their customers directly. And for that issue, by the way, the social, uh, the, the digital platform that you um, are going to discuss today might be key. So I really want to listen to your ideas about that because that's something we need. It's not just, a, uh, you know, we want to get cool digital. We really need so digital solutions uh, for both the welfare of the people who need care and the people who are going to offer care. I'm going to stop here. I think I already talked too much. It's a very broad topic. It's going to be very interesting. I really wish you a good discussion today. Next time, Dragos is going to be here. In the meantime, have a good, um, good panel. And thank you very much for, for the invitation. Thank, thank you, you very much, uh, very much uh, Bogdan. Uh, I now would like to hand over to uh, uh, Thomas Bignell, uh, Policy Manager of ESPD. Thomas, please. Thank you very much, uh, Luke and uh, Bogdan, for that introduction which I, I think already covered and set the scene very well for this uh, discussion. First of all, Luke uh, spoke, I think, very clearly about the, both the opportunities that our sector uh, represents for the people that we support, uh, but also some of the challenges that we have. Uh, and that was followed by Mr. Dilianu, who covered very well the, uh, the different types of European Union policies that can help our sector to solve some of these issues. Uh, Bogdan spoke about uh, this new, uh, the new EU budget, and in particular the recovery and resilience facility, which can go a long way to solving some of these issues, but also talking about some more, uh, let's say, legis legislative or some policy oriented uh, programs such as the European Pillar of Social Rights uh, and so forth. These are all topics that we will discuss uh, further in the uh, program. Um, but first of all, we would like to uh, pass the floor to Mr. To Professor Gerard Quinn, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities very recently appointed in this position. So very, thank you very much for, for joining us so early in your, in your tenure. Um, and hopefully we can hear from you, your thoughts on, let's say, the, the upcoming challenges and opportunities for services uh, in the years to come. Uh, Gerard, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Oops. Is that okay? Is the noise, the sound quality okay? Okay. Thanks. It's okay. Um, it's nice to say hi to Jim living next door in the UK, uh, but also to our Georgian friends. I'm really delighted to see you uh, on this webinar. Um, Georgia is one of my favorite countries uh, for many, many different reasons. Um, and thanks for giving me the space, Luke, to just share some reflections on social rights uh, and the future of services. Um, I. It's very early in my mandate, um, but I'm already minded to make the future of services one of the core themes going forward. And that would of course apply not just to developed countries like in the European Union, but to other countries in the developing South where currently there are no services and therefore a lot more freedom to imagine and then create something that's durable and sustainable into the future. Um, two or three preliminary remarks. Um, I was one of those who was involved directly in drafting 
the UN Treaty on the Rights of People with Disabilities. I must say, going into the process, we had a very naive view that this would be a treaty on equality, equal opportunities, and non-discrimination. And we're quickly disabused of that view. Um, it is a treaty on equality, but it's much more than that. And the reason we were disabused of that is a lot of NGOs from many, many parts of the world turned up and say it's not enough to deal with equality and discrimination. You've got to deal with the root cause. And the root cause from their point of view was a lack of respect for the personhood and for the dignity and for the autonomy of persons with disabilities. That's why the personhood provisions in the convention are the key anchorage points of the convention based on autonomy, but also on belonging and inclusion. Um, and indeed a concept of living in your own space, in your own home with the right kinds of services. So that was novel and everything is referable back to that. And I would say even to the nth degree of how you plan and implement services gets back to that. The other innovation was that unlike most previous treaties, this treaty melded together, mixed up together, civil and political rights with economic, social and cultural rights. So far, far from being separated out, and even denominated into separate headings or articles, the decision was made that both sets of rights would actually be melded together. And arguably that was the vision of the original Bill of Rights going back to Eleanor Roosevelt in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, and indeed in the 1940s with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It makes life difficult for lawyers because it's hard to figure out which aspect of Article 19 is a civil right, which aspect of Article 19 is an economic and social right, but who cares about the lawyers, okay? Uh, the idea was that we engineer the social provision, the social rights to give life to the civil liberties, the new autonomy rights that had been freely uh, won during the negotiations. If you use a term from contract law that we use as contract lawyers, the social rights give business efficacy to the newfound autonomy and dignity and participation rights uh, in the convention. So right from the get-go, it's kind of a new image of social rights. It's not social rights in a passive sense of let's say maintaining people at the edge of society. It's social rights that enables people to be who they want to be in life and in society and indeed in the economy. So, so very, very interesting um, convention, very interesting conception of social rights. That's arguably the original conception of social rights and a very kind of enabling philosophy, so to speak. So the CRPD then points to all of these systemic changes, uh, kind of um, undoing 50 or 60 years and then reverse engineering all of the social provision we've inherited to make sure they're turned around to underpin and not to undermine individual autonomy and participation rights. Uh, all of that is um, reinforced by the deep logic of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Extremely interesting document. If you do a deep read of it, what you come up with is a circular notion of society and the economy and indeed the climate and the environment. So we're breaking down very, very traditional uh, walls between the economy on the one hand and society on the other hand, and we're melding them together in very, very creative ways into the future. And that gives us a lot more space for policy imagination to do things differently, not simply to pour new money into old vessels, but to rethink these vessels uh, right from the get-go. Um, and I think the time is right now to be rethinking things. And, and we have the golden opportunity in U the European Union that the Union, one of its added values is it can create space for innovation, 
to prove new concepts or disprove new concepts as the case may be. The time is right, I think, for a number of reasons. Um, you yourself, uh, Luke, mentioned the COVID uh, emergency. There's been a lot of documentation on the negative impacts of COVID right around the world, not just in the European Union. And the leitmotif, the thing that brings it all together is the realization that during crises, the truth comes to the surface. And the truth was that in reacting to the emergency, the old way of thinking, the old paradigm actually was more powerful than the new one. So systems reverted to type, uh, the objectification of persons with disabilities was the departure point, and indeed their invisibility in how we reacted to the crisis was quite striking. And it's remarkable to me that an august body, rather conservative body, uh, like the World Bank, saw through all of this immediately. They have an amazing report this summer, which points right to the lack of continuity and stability in service systems around the world for those most marginalized. I don't like that language, but that's the language used. And it invites, it calls for a radical transformation in how we conceive and how we deliver services into the future. Uh, we've also seen that from other reports, um, but to me, the World Bank report is the one that really cuts through all of the jargon and uh, reveals the core challenge in the way ahead. So recovery, yes, but recovery with a difference in the sense that the ground rules have to shift, the ground rules have to change. And I would say this is just another way of reminding us that the dignity and personhood uh, grund norms, if you will, or departure points of the convention should be the way in which we unfold services into the future and reverse engineer them to make sure that they subservice people with disabilities. The other really interesting thing that comes through from a lot of the analysis is that we've suffered from excessive um, silo-based approaches, ground-centric approaches, and I mean, there's a lot of sexiness to the talk about intersectionality. Most of it is uh, rhetoric, but some of it is very valuable. And it's not so much comparing and contrasting one group with another that's important. It's that by doing so, it enables us to get at deeper problems, deeper challenges, and maybe common solutions. Somebody mentioned the future of long-term care. I'm sure you'll recall two years ago, three years ago, the European Social Protection Committee produced a very interesting report on the future of long-term care in Europe for older persons. And surprise, surprise, they came to the conclusion that the future of long-term care rests in community support and the imagination of new kinds of services to enable older people to live in the community. Well, What's so distinguishable between that and the right to independent living and community belonging that we take for granted in the disability sector? Take for granted, at least at a rhetorical level, the practice is something quite different. And I will remind you that the federal agency to draw together all strands of funding to ensure community living in the US uh, targets both older people and persons with disabilities and generates research to enable the individual states to move forward in that particular direction. So I think whatever we do, whatever recovery strategies we have, there's gonna to have to be a very strong intersectional dimension focusing on common solutions and not silo-based solutions as, as in the past. That's not to mean you neglect the difference of disability or the difference of old age, but it does mean that there should be a renewed emphasis on developing common ways forward and not silo specific ways forward. Uh, I think the time is right also because the McKinsey uh, consultancy firm two years ago pointed out the world of work is changing, um, how we organize work is changing, um, 
how we acknowledge informal care alongside formal care is changing. Um, and the ILO has done some remarkable work on the future of work. And in fact, has done a very specific piece of work on persons with disabilities and the future of work going forward, which I think bears a lot of attention. Um, but I would also say, and this is really my personal plea, is that maybe, maybe the time is right to begin um, acknowledging openly the feminization of poverty that's attached to either formal care or informal care. You may have noticed recently the UN Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women um, held one particular country in violation of that convention because women, and it was usually women, who took time out, let's say in their 40s or their 50s to mind, an elderly, elderly adult or parent or a child with a disability were hit twice over when it came to retirement with very, very reduced pension entitlements. And that the committee found to be an explicit form of gender-based discrimination. And by the way, the McKinsey report predicts that a lot of the growth of employment in the future will come from converting a lot of these informal roles into formal employment. And it's incredibly important that we avoid precarious employment models for these people and offer career pathways for them as well. So I think there might be an opportunity to finally and fairly square, square up to that phenomena. The um, European Social Protection Committee report made a decent stab at actually unpacking it, uh, but it created the space for addressing it. It doesn't actually provide a solution for it. I also think the time is right because there's a lot going on out there. Um, some of you may be familiar with the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia. That's, um, it has some flaws, but nevertheless, it's working in the right direction toward the personalization of services and so forth. We've not really done a good job at joining up the dots and doing the learning that is needed from the transformation that's already happening in services right around the world. And last but not least, there is the advent of new electronic platforms that will, whether we like it or not, shake up the sector and shake up the industry into the 21st century. Uh, there's a lot of risks associated with that, but there's also a lot of opportunities. And it's obviously in the public interest to begin unpacking the risks as well as the opportunities and then imagining what's the best way forward. Um, and you can see immediately the attractiveness of this because of it places voice, choice and control in the hands of our citizens, then from a public interest point of view, what's not to like. Of course, what's not to like is several of these risks, including precarious employment, um, but it's incumbent on us to study this now so that it doesn't hit us uh, unknowing, so to speak, and we can plan for its proper integration into the future of services. So as I said, um, I'm, I'm very minded to do a thematic project as UN Special Rapporteur on the future of services, um, and hopefully interactively with other special rep, uh, rapporteurs, including the one on the rights of older persons. And I'm considering opening up a project on the impact of artificial intelligence on people with disabilities, as well as in the service sector. Uh, but that remains to be seen. It's, it's very early days in my mandate. I will very closely track what you're doing because I think um, you're one of the first in the world to be really thinking about the future of services. And as I say, the European Union is blessed in that you have the space to prove concepts, to, to take risks, and to facilitate innovation. So with that, I hand you back to Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gerard, for that, uh, I think, very uh, solid overview covering so many so many different points. It's difficult to, to reflect on, on all of them. I think in terms of your uh, activities for, uh, in terms of the thematic project on the future of services and all that, you, you definitely have a partner 
in us a, a, a GSPD. And on the second hand, uh, I think in terms of uh, the need for, for creative action, finding new ideas for, for transforming how services are provided, uh, in my view, the EU has a, a big role to play in this, in, in creating a facilitating sort of system at national level to allow the services to, to, to take on this. Uh, that's, uh... mentioned earlier about the EU budget that has a massive role to play. I think we will talk earlier about some of the programs there, uh, but also the action plan on the pillar of social rights and so forth. Um, so the EU, especially in the next year or two, has, I think, a very important role to, to implement this. Uh, and uh, we will then now be talking a bit more about the, the EU agenda. But thank you, Professor Quinn, for, for such a good overview, plenty of food for thought. And now I'll pass the floor to Asel, uh, my colleague Asel, uh, Senior Policy Officer at ESPD, who will present very briefly in four or five minutes um, our main positions on many of these different issues uh, before uh, moving on to the panel discussions. Asel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the previous speakers. I think a lot of points have been raised and you will see that there will be, uh, I'll be coming back to them, uh, to many of them during the uh, presentation that I uh, will be leading right now. Uh, so to lay the foundation for uh, discussions later today, I have prepared some slides summarizing ESPD positions um, on different upcoming EU initiatives, uh, and uh, uh, namely these are European Pillar of Social Rights, the upcoming disability strategy, uh, the Action Plan for Social Economy and the European Child Guarantee. Uh, we'll start with the European Pillar of Social Rights. Uh, what is it? It is a, um, a compass for uh, the European Union in uh, delivering social rights to uh, uh, European citizens. And it is uh, made uh, of, um, it consists of 20 principles uh, on uh, various topics, uh, uh, including the equal opportunities in the uh, labor market, uh, fair working conditions, uh, social protection and inclusion. You can see them uh, on this slide in front of you. Uh, the uh, uh, European Commission launched a consultation uh, on the action plan in implementing the European Pillar of Social Rights, and ESPD has submitted uh, uh, our, their position paper uh, focusing on the main uh, priority areas that include uh, the general recognition of social care and support services, uh, the need for sustainable funding and investment, digitalization and innovation, uh, support for workforce development, uh, and of course, improved uh, data collection information and uh, indicators for both disability and services. Uh, and uh, it goes back to a uh, uh, general notion of uh, continued uh, non-discrimination and inclusion of persons with disability. Uh, the key recommendations include uh, the development of um, an EU framework for care services to set minimum quality standards. Uh, also, uh, one of the uh, recommendations that we make uh, relates to the EU recovery and resilience facility that was mentioned uh, earlier by Mr. Deliano, and we would like to encourage uh, uh, the use of at least 25% of these funds in uh, social investments. Uh, uh, another uh, recommendation concerns digitalization and innovation. Uh, as uh, Mr. Quinn mentioned, uh, it is a, a big opportunity to uh, look at uh, uh, opportunities, but also uh, at the risks uh, and uh, further develop innovation in our sector and uh, funding programs like Horizon 2020, uh, Horizon Europe, sorry, would uh, uh, could support such kind of initiatives. Uh, further support for recruitment, retainment, uh, and uh, training of workforce uh, is uh, one of the uh, main uh, uh, priority areas for us as well. And uh, so the um, in terms of collection of data and uh, indicators, uh, we would recommend to uh, European organizations such as Eurostat, Eurofund uh, to, connect, uh, to, start, uh, to collect disability disaggregated data. Uh, in terms of um, 
financing services, it is really important to go beyond minimum income provisions and uh, uh, make sure that uh, sufficient financing is available for services. Uh, and you, uh, of course, European initiatives uh, such as uh, disability strategy, uh, the action plan on social economy, etc., should uh, consider uh, the sector in all of their activities. Um, I will go quickly through the uh, European disability agenda. Uh, the uh, position, Sarah, yeah. If it's possible, maybe we can cut at this point. Uh, okay. Because I know Ms. Mashova has to leave uh, close to uh, three o'clock. And maybe we could come back to them afterwards if we have some time. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Asel. Um, so Asel, uh, of course, uh, there's many, I mean, the, the high point of, of Asel's input is that the EU is very active on the social policy agenda over the next year, primarily with the European Pillar of Social Rights, but also quite a few different initiatives which come from that, such as the European Disability Strategy, the Child Guarantee, and the Action Plan on the Social Economy. Uh, and now, over the next uh, hour and a half, we will be going through panel discussions to discuss in a bit more detail uh, these uh, policy uh, agenda, how members of the European Parliament see it, uh, how it's seen also by uh, stakeholders on the ground. So we also have uh, members of our executive committee who will be talking a bit about their experiences at, at, at local or national level. Um, and we're trying to bring this together, bring, bring together the experiences and challenges uh, at local level together with the European initiatives. Um, so the first panel focuses a bit more on the uh, European Disability Strategy, uh, and I would like to welcome Ms. Mashova uh, to this uh, panel discussion. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, the, uh, you're very involved in, in the Employment Committee uh, of the European Parliament, in the uh, FEM Committee, in, in many different important committees for us. Um, what are the plans of the European Parliament with regard to the Disability Strategy, and, and what would you like to see? Thank you, for your, thank you for your attention. Um, I am grateful to the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities for the organization of this event. It's great to see that we are all united in our effort and ambitions to work towards a more equal Europe. Uh, for European uh, Parliament, uh, social services are central creating a caring, inclusive and productive society. Yet despite the important role that these services play in our society, they are oftentimes left uh, unrecognized and without sufficient funding, as uh, my colleague said. Uh, furthermore, the COVID-19 pandemic tested the limit uh, of the sector and despite the innovative uh, solution and adaptability of the services, the pandemic and the measure adopted by the member states exacerbate the current challenges. Uh, as a shadow rapporteur on behalf of my group Renew Europe for the resolution on the new disability strategy post 2020, I am therefore glad that the resolution recognizes the essential role of the services and assistance and considers it necessary to define minimum standards at the EU level in order to guarantee that all the needs of persons with disabilities are met and stresses the need to enable all EU citizens to have guaranteed access to social support services across all the EU. The resolution on the new disability strategy also stresses the necessity to properly implement the UNCRPD and I firmly believe that the establishment of UNCRPD focal points in all EU institutions, EU institution, uh, as was for the first time recognized in uh, 2015 uh, in the concluding observation of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, is essential to achieve the implementation of the UN, UNCRPD. And I therefore and also my colleague put our efforts into this within my activities in the European Parliament. I would also like to mention Renew Europe's commitments to ensure the rights of persons with disabilities that I initiate and presented to the Commission and public uh, before last summer. And we have support of uh, uh, Mrs. Helena Daly and also all my colleagues in Renew Europe. 
In the text, we in Renew Europe declare our commitment to take practical, concrete steps to create a truly inclusive society. And we have not forgotten about those working in the care sector, including addressing the needs of informal caregivers. To conclude, the role of social services in creating the conditions that uh, enable everyone to function as a full member of society and advancing their, uh, their human and fundamental rights is indispensable. And um, I am happy uh, to be able to highlight this here today and support this sector in the future. And I believe that uh, all my colleagues from Renew have the same. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for the floor. I'm sorry I need to leave uh, to the other action, but I am for you here and uh, I enjoy uh, our future uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Mr. Mashrova, for that. And I, I know that you, you had to leave uh, very soon, so I'm very appreciative of the fact that you can you can join us and, and, and give your views on, on these topics. Uh, indeed, the resolution on the uh, the next European Disability Strategy was uh, was very positive for us. Uh, and, and looking into this call for minimum standards on, you know, on access to services is, of course, something which is very important for us to make sure that everyone in Europe is, is treated and has access to the right type of support that they need. Uh, irrespective of where people uh, live. Uh, so we look forward to working with you in this in more detail in the months to, to come. Um, now I'd like to pass the floor to Valeria Buzan, who is uh, Vice President of EASPD, but is also extremely active in uh, Slovenia uh, in many uh, different fields. Um, Valeria, how has the last few months been for you in terms of you in terms of the, the, the disability services in, in Slovenia? Uh, what are the challenges? What have been the opportunities? Um, the floor is yours, Valeria. Well, Thank you very much. Um, well, as you know, that uh, for people with disabilities, as millions of others, excluded. Excuse groups, me, Valeria. We can't hear you very well. Maybe can you put your mouth closer to the microphone? Better. I think this is better. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. As we know, for um, people with disabilities and millions of others excluded groups, social care and support is essential to helping them enjoy their fundamental rights. It's important not only for them, it's important for um, their families, friends, society. Uh, as uh, you said before, as women typically spend more time in unpaid care work, the availability of care and support allowed them to take up jobs, ensuring equal employment opportunities, better work-life balance, and improved gender equality. Services enable equal opportunities for experiences and knowledge through practice while and training and work. As you said, I came from Slovenia and uh, in some other countries in our region as well, children can uh, stay at home uh, and do not get any extra opportunities for learning and getting new experiences, while later also don't get uh, new opportunities for employment and training. Uh, quality care and support can also offer safety and protection along the entire life circles of individuals, even uh, when the family is no longer there. Um, enabling employment uh, also means more workforce that can help in the economy growth and performance. In much of Europe, um, uh, elderly and persons with special needs require services adapted to their needs. This become uh, even more pressing in aging society. Services in Northern Europe are often segregated and are not located in communities. Now in uh, the, the pandemic time, the situation is even worse. Um, while being vital for health and safety concept like uh, distancing and self-isolation can be obstructive for social inclusion and equal participation. 
we realize uh, that services are important and affect all stages in life, so they should be well developed and offer different responses to the needs of individuals. Um, this is uh, short uh, uh, thinking about uh, how it's a care in uh, this northern part of Europe. Uh, we hope that uh, this pandemic situation will push uh, our governments to change uh, a lot of things. Thank you very much, Federia. So quite quite similar to, to the line that uh, Mr. Professor Jared Quinn said about how we need to learn the lessons from from this COVID pandemic and and, and do quite a to, to strengthen and maybe accelerate the way that we provide care, which is more community based and, and person centered. Um, I think now we have a uh, we were meant to have a, a speaker, Miss Julius Nikolsonova, uh, who is the chair of the Employment and Social Affairs Committee in the, of the Parliament join us, but unfortunately she is stuck in, in negotiations right now, but I believe that she has shared a video with us. And my colleague, Dimitri, can you put the video up? So this is uh, Ms. Dewis Nikosanova, who is also a member of the European Parliament and the Chair of the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs. Dimitri? Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for organizing this important event. I regret not being with you today. However, I'd like to address a few points. As you know, we have made important progress, but we also face new challenges and have a lot of work ahead of us. There are an estimated 100 million persons with disabilities in the European Union who are still deprived of their basic human rights and access to equal treatment. Labor market, for instance, is one such problematic area where the current employment rate is standing at 50.6% compared with 74.8% among persons without disabilities. The COVID-19 crisis has deepened existing problems and created the new ones. Persons with disabilities have experienced serious challenges and rights violations during this time, such as disruption in personal assistance, care and support services, as well as lack of precautionary measures in residential institutions. As members of Parliament, we call on the Commission to build on what we achieved through the resolution on the European Disability Post 2020 and upscale the commitments in all policy areas through a comprehensive and long-term disability strategy. In our view, it should include definitions of key terms, in particular of disability, contain clear and measurable targets and list of planned actions with clear timeframes and allocated resources, mainstream the rights of all persons with disabilities into policies and in all areas, include a child-sensitive approach, to name just a few. The key thing is to cooperate with persons with disabilities in the process. We therefore urge the Commission to prepare the strategy with close, meaningful and systematic co cooperation with them and their representative family members and other organizations. We will also push for improvement in necessary services. It is fundamental to ensure a high level of services and define minimum standards at EU level in order to guarantee that all the needs of persons with disabilities are met. Additionally, working with the private sector one portal that contains all the instruments aimed at providing optimal social participation should be created. These measures should help ensure the right to live independently and be included in the community. So, as you can see, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but I believe through dialogue and cooperation we can achieve further improvement for those who are the most vulnerable ones. Thank you very much. So thank you for what is quite a, a clear message, I think, by uh, Ms. Juris Nikosonova on uh, the Commission on the Parliament's uh, perspective on, on the European Disability Strategy. And I think, you know, the, the, what comes very clearly from that message is, is to go that the Commission and the EU should go beyond, let's say, words and a strategy, but they should come with very clear actions, um, targets, clear time timeframes. So in view of seeing, let's see, actionable uh, changes on the ground to support the type of activities that Valeria has just uh, mentioned. 
And again, a very clear message that um, the, the future of, of disability services is really uh, in the community, person-centered, uh, and, and in view of enabling people to enjoy their social rights like uh, other people. And therefore that, that comes with, uh, let's say, consequences of how the EU spends its programs, for example, budgets and so forth. Um, I will, unless there are any questions, I see one question maybe uh, with regard to Valeria. Um, in Slovenia, ha has there been any, uh, let's say, positive discrimination practices to support uh, people with disabilities during the COVID pandemic? And have families been provided with social support during this team time? Uh, would you be able to speak a bit about that, your experience in Slovenia on that topic? Um, I can say for Slovenia, um, it's, a, it's a problem because we have each few months new government, and we have now a uh, few months of new government, and the um, pandemic was uh, first, uh, first part of the pandemic was uh, a little bit better for Slovenia, but now it's uh, really a huge problem because a lot of people uh, live in institutions special elderly people, they, they die, uh, a lot of people die. And our government, government don't have ideas how to handle in this uh, specific situation. So um, a situation is really very worst and um, the, the, the really bad situation is for people with special needs because they close school programs, uh, all people stay at home. Uh, it's now two months, and um, uh, children and uh, adults with special needs are uh, without uh, physiotherapy, without education. So um, it's a really a huge problem uh, how to solve this problem now after this pandemic. I hope that will be soon, but uh, for now it's really. Uh, it's really very bad situation. Thank you, Valeria. So not, not really, a, let's say, promising practices, but a clear message that um, the EU action that should be done in this regard should really look into how, in particular, the impact on families of people who are sensitive to disabilities during this pandemic, who have often have to take out, have to, have to perform a lot of the support and the care without the formal professional services during this pandemic, which of course puts a lot of, um, a lot of pressure on these, on these families. Uh, and we need to, to try and uh, adapt that situation and try and find a solution. And now I'd like to pass the floor to Asel again to uh, provide some words on ESPD's view on the European disability strategy. Uh, yes, thank you, Tom. Uh, in terms of the European disability strategy, from the perspective of ESPD, of course, it's uh, first and foremost uh, the recognition of uh, social services, social care and support uh, for persons with disabilities. So there is a need for strengthening and improving the whole ecosystem of social services uh, and to uh, recognize uh, its ability to facilitate the implementation of UNCRPD, uh, the uh, pillar of social rights um, in delivering uh, rights to uh, persons with disabilities. Um, and of course, it was mentioned earlier, but uh, to highlight uh, again the promotion uh, to uh, transition towards community-based services and moving away from uh, institutionalized uh, services. Uh, in terms of uh, coverage of different aspects of life, of course, there is uh, needs to be a focus on facilitating frameworks that promote uh, access to services throughout the lifespan of a person from uh, early childhood intervention to education, uh, employment, and also uh, arts and uh, uh, free time. Uh, and uh, we had a, a very interesting event a few days ago about uh, the inclusive arts. So I think this is area that uh, also um, deserves uh, more attention. Uh, and of course, he, uh, we are coming back to the topic of COVID-19 again, uh, uh, tackling the negative effects that are um, 
uh, that the pandemic is having on our sector, on the uh, services that are being provided for persons with disabilities uh, and the well-being of, uh, of the users of these services. Uh, so the European disability agenda, the upcoming agenda, uh, has uh, the potential to, to uh, have an impact in all these areas and I think it should be uh, acted upon. Sorry, I was uh, muted. Thank you very much, Asel, for uh, those, those words. And, and I think what we would like to see in the in the next European Disability Strategy for the next uh, 10 years is, of course, uh, a confirmation again on the need to support the transition to community-based services that Mr. Uh, Gerard Quinn uh, mentioned earlier, um, but also to make sure that we can respond to some of the structural challenges that our sector has. And that includes uh, underfunding, so what role for the EU in tackling the underfunding of social services. Uh, also, uh, major issues in terms of staff shortages uh, across Europe. Again, what role for the EU in trying to tackle these issues and the EU can have some instruments to do that. Uh, and last but not least, really supporting innovation across the board in the sector. After every crisis, very often, um, let's say the, the the public investment tends to reduce, and which mean which not only reduces the investment into the sector, but it also reduces investment into into innovation, into fresh new ideas. Uh, whereas actually, what we really need now is is investment into fresh new ideas to make sure we have the best types of services. So we really need to make sure that we avoid uh, making the mistakes that we've made in the past, in particular on on past crises, where we tend to focus on on doing the bare minimum, investing on the the more traditional forms of services and that that has a consequence for the people that we're supporting so we need to make sure that we continue to innovate in our sector in the years to come so thank you uh, valeria and uh, our other speakers in this uh, last panel i would like to move on to the next panel discussion we have which is focusing a bit more on the employment of uh, persons with disabilities in the social economy and so forth we have two uh, guest speakers who I can see. Uh, I'm glad they've, they've managed to join on time. On time. We have Javier Guemes from the uh, ONSE Social Group, uh, but also newly elected Vice President of EASPD. And I'm glad we'll also uh, have Miss Monica Semedo, who is member of the European Parliament from uh, Luxembourg, very active on disability issues and also on the social economy. Welcome to both of you. Um, Javier, um, the employment of persons with disabilities, it's always been a major challenge. Uh, the, the, there's a very large gap between the employment rates of people without disabilities and people with disabilities. But your, your group in, in Spain is actively trying to uh, tackle this difference. Uh, how do you do it and, and what are the challenges uh, up to date? Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you to ESPD for this opportunity to discuss about employment, which is always unfortunately present in many discussions for many years when we speak about the rights of persons with disabilities. Let me just share one slide with you just to understand the problem we are speaking about. Well, in this slide, you can see what is the situation on the impact, sorry, it's in Spanish, but I will translate a little bit, on the first wave of the COVID-19 this year. Less than 32% in employment of persons with disabilities has been really the first impact of the first wave. We are now measuring what's going to be the second wave in this period. Just as a point of, of, of attention, in the previous one, in the 20, 2008 and 2009, just 18% was the difference, minus 18%. Just in the first semester this year is minus uh, 32%. Well, so when we are speaking about the employment of persons with disabilities, we really need to take pay attention to several factors that affect employment services. First of all, we have to recognize that employment services are very diverse, very diverse in their nature. So we have public, we have private. Among the public, you have governmental services, local services, regional services, you have universities, you have NGOs, you have foundations. Like for example, we have ourselves, ONSE Foundation has a system called INSERTA, which is using European social fund to make sure that we can promote employment of persons with disabilities. So there is a different nature in many, in many of the service providers and employment, but we also have a many challenges that are also attached to the employment of persons with disabilities for all societies. First of all, we are discussing a very diverse 
group. It is very important to understand that when we are speaking about the employment of persons with disabilities, the diversity is a factor. We also have to speak about the level of training and the capacity they have in the studies. Just to mention something, for example, in Spain, just 16.9% of persons with disabilities have a university degree. So we really need to face the situation where the training levels, the knowledge in the, in the studies of persons with disabilities is significantly lower than persons without disabilities. We need to make sure also that we have developed enough services for inclusion in the labor market. One out of four persons with disabilities are employed in Spain. There are still three quarters which are not employed. We have to speak about also the labor conditions. Just to let you know that, for example, in Spain, we can say that 34% of employees with disabilities, they can develop just 20% of their potential capacity of time for employment. So we need to also invest in knowing and understanding the labor conditions. We have to see a speak out salaries, for example, in Spain, 17.3% uh, less is the minimum, sorry, is the average salary of persons with disabilities in our country. So it's still very far from the average of persons without disabilities. We need to speak about, for example, the contracts. In Spain, every year, 1.6% of the contracts are for persons with disabilities just 1.6. Consider that they represent the 6% of the labor force, we are still far for getting to a satisfactory point. We need to make sure as well that the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the mainstream labor market is uh, achieved. 60% of the companies are not adapted to include employees with disabilities. We also have to say that in Spain, 76% of employees with disabilities are in the mainstream labor market but we still have 24% in the so-called shelter workshops, which is a method for inclusion also of persons with disabilities. And we need to invest in the quality of this uh, type of employment. And we hope that in Europe, we will manage to have a push to make sure that the quality of those services is reviewed in all countries. But we also have poverty levels. You know that 32.5% of persons with disabilities are poor in Spain. And this is five points more than persons without disabilities. But even if they work, still 20% of employees with disabilities are working poor. So we need to invest also in knowing better the working poor with disabilities in our societies. Well, just to finalize with some European messages according to this reality. We need to make sure that the European institutions develop a clear, employment action plan for persons with disabilities. Maybe it is included in the disability strategy, maybe it is included in the skills strategy, I don't know. But we need to make sure that we move ahead just for the non-discrimination directive because we need to invest more time to understand the whole factors from university studies, from uh, initial points of poverty, from other any reality which is involved in the employment process of persons with disabilities. We need a comprehensive action plan to make sure that the employment of persons with disabilities is taken seriously. And I think we need a European Parliament. I'm very happy that Mrs. Monica Semedo is with us. As Luke mentioned at the beginning, there are many MEPs, but definitely the report that is being produced in the Parliament today does not answer the whole problematic on the employment of persons with disabilities. We really hope that in the amendments procedure, we will manage to have a better quality on that report. Let me just mention that for this European response, we need to have this comprehensive view to make sure that the quality and employment is there, that the funding is, is, is put at the disposal of this system and not a traditional funding of structural funds. Let's look also, in the, for example, in the European Investment Fund. We need to make sure that the other types of investments are taken into account in the employment of persons with disabilities. We need to make sure, and this Gerard Quinn was really great in, the, in his intervention, that artificial intelligence is controlled in the way employment is made for persons with disabilities. Exclusion is coming now from the digital technology which is applied to the employment services. We need to explore more in that regard. We need to make sure also that the support services are clear. For example, in the state aids, for example, in public procurement, which has been a great barrier also for the social economy in Europe. 
we need to make sure that employment of persons with disabilities is analyzed from the perspective of the Green Deal, from the social affairs, and from the digital technology. Until we get there, we will continue having exactly the same levels as we had in many different eras before this one. We are, and I just coming back to my first idea, we are not in the same Europe that six months ago. The impact in the contrast of persons with disabilities, their situation, they, they, they're more, they have more difficulties to catch up in this reality. So really we have to make sure that the European Union takes seriously the employment of persons with disabilities. Thank you very much, Thomas, and I'm happy to answer if there is any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Javier, for I think a very clear, a clear message for, for the EU institutions, the need for an action plan for the employment of persons with disabilities. That's true for the last what, 10, 5, 10 years, we, we, we always hear of the employment of people with disabilities being a, a priority for, for the European Union, um, but then the specific activities that have been done have been uh, reasonably limited. There is, however, one, one area where the European Union plays a very active role, and that's in the European Social Fund and the upcoming European Social Fund Plus. So I would like to maybe move to, to Ms. Semedo, who is uh, a member of the European Parliament, uh, very active on uh, the European Social Fund and on the employment uh, and the social economy uh, area. Uh, Mr. Medo, um, can you tell us a bit about your activities to try and boost the employment of persons with disabilities and, and some opportunities you see there? Yes, uh, hello to everybody. Thank you uh, for having me um, for this very important uh, um, topic. Um, first and foremost, uh, people with disabilities are part of our, of our society. There are about uh, 100 million uh, people. Um, and they should also be um, at 100% part of our society. So those who want to contrib contribute to our European society should also uh, be able to do so. If they want to contribute to the society in order uh, for, for more prosperity while going or having an employment, we should really remove all barriers uh, to this access. Um, yes, it is uh, very important to um, include to have, to have an inclusive European um, um, society. And um, as one of the shadow rapporteurs of the European Social Fund Plus, I'm also uh, underlining um, uh, that people with disabilities are included. I do it as well uh, during the negotiations uh, on the Creative Europe uh, Fund. Uh, because also in culture and art, um, people with disabilities do already, but should even more have access to express themselves and be active. So um, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, the European Social Fund Plus, we are now in the uh, negotiations and um, the European the Employment and Social Inclusion Strand, uh, formerly known as the uh, Progress Strand, um, under the current funding period um, is included into the ESF uh, plus, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> so this was chosen uh, deliberately by the commission to have each part of the current easy program, if I can shorten it, uh, under management with more related topics and to incorporate it better in larger programs uh, instead of a program of its own. So under the easy strand, the ESF will support social innovation and social progress in partnership with the social partners, civil society organizations and public and private bodies. It will also promote, uh, promote workers' mobility and boost employment opportunities by um, raising availability and accessibility of microfinance for micro enterprises and social economy um, enterprises. And as one of the co-chairs, of the social economy intergroup. Um, I really uh, defend uh, this because these uh, social economy enterprises, they have strong links with the community, uh, with marginalized and disadvantaged groups and uh, have also uh, a lot of experience. So they know where the issues lie and uh, can help to make uh, the EU more inclusive and especially the economy. So therefore, I'm glad um, that we are making good progress 
on this, um, since for me this program is very important. But um, it will be incorporated under the new SF, ESF, but the Parliament negotiation team is a bit worried that it will not be used um, at its full potential. So we therefore insist, insist and we will keep insisting uh, that the easy working program will be elaborated by a special committee and by consulting and including all relevant stakeholders like all of you. So with a decreased budget of the ESF plus, you must be able to make the programs as efficient as possible to take the most out of the funds we have. It will be a challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Semido, for that overview. And very important also to talk about Creative Europe a program, which is to support cultural and arts. I know you spoke a few months ago, a few weeks ago now, uh, as in the ESPD conference on arts. So I know it's, a, it's a, an area which you're very interested in. And the European Social Fund uh, Plus is the major EU program in social affairs, but also on employment related issues. I think it's uh, it's been cut a bit in, in a current proposal. Um, so therefore, the the call for ESF Plus to be made as effective as possible uh, for uh, let's say those the organisations who who provide support on the ground is very important. And I would like maybe to come back to Javier Gomez. I know that you the Onset Social Group is one of the, um, the mediators of the European Social Fund in Spain. So you have a lot of experience with the, the program. Um, what are your thoughts on the current uh, program? Uh, and where could it maybe be? What, what are the points that we should really look into and, and try and make sure are improved or, or there in the final negotiation? Thank you, Thomas. Well, definitely the story of the structural funds and the inclusion of on the right of persons with disabilities inside the funds, it has been uh, for the last 15 years uh, a successful story, in the sense that the structural funds, uh, they included some years ago already an article uh, in regard to the inclusion of persons with disabilities. And this was an article really that allowed in many ways, many organizations and, and public authorities around Europe to have a specific projects in the employment of persons with disabilities. Ourselves, as uh, ONCE Social Group and through our foundation, ONCE Foundation, we have really managed to implement uh, as an intermediate body, many, many programs that allow us to mobilize uh, resources to make sure that around 9,000 people per year find an employment in the mainstream labor market. But now we are at the end of the very difficult negotiations of the structural funds. And this includes also the ESF Plus, the European Social Fund Plus. We have found, and I think this is a very important message, and I will just focus on this one because I would like to take advantage of the presence of the members of the European Parliament in this regard. We have found that the co-funding schemes that are required for social inclusion are now even higher than they were in the previous uh, programming period. This is really strange. Because social inclusion and considering that we are having even more impact in the social inclusion of persons with disabilities today than we had seven years ago, we need to make sure that uh, co-funding for local authorities, regional authorities, or even for private uh, actors like we have ourselves, we are as on the foundation, it is no cumbersome and it's not higher now than it was in the previous programming period. We are trying to fight to have an exclusion from the co-funding rates of the social inclusion projects. And we need to make sure that co-funding, it is not higher now required for organizations coming from the social inclusion sector than it was before. So we really claim, and it is possible to the European Parliament to be very clear with the European Council or Council of the European Union to make sure that the co-funding rates are not increased for social inclusion projects. We hope that we will manage. Let's see. Thank you, Javier. I don't know if Ms. Simido would like to provide some feedback on, on, on those points or other points that, that you deem important for us to, to be aware of in terms of the negotiations. Yes, of course. Um... Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, uh, 
Mr. Wimmers. Um, I fully under understand that issue um, from the perspective of the organizations and those involved in, in these <coughs> programs, sorry. Um, unfortunately, um, we are already very late in the legislative, legislative process, sorry. Um, therefore, it will be very difficult to introduce the amendment you also um, send us um, at this current uh, stage of the negotiations. Um, however, um, I'm one of the shadow uh, rapporteurs of the European Social Fund Plus and my colleagues, Mr. Kassa and Mr. Benify, will also participate uh, in, um, in this uh, panel. So maybe you can also address that question uh, to them and uh, we can discuss it uh, further at our shadows meeting on, on Wednesday. Um, but um, this is not included in the European Parliament's a man mandate and we have to stick um, to that mandate that was given um, to us, us um, and you. We have to hurry uh, now to get um, the European Social Fund Plus um, in a, to get it finalized because also all the people and uh, the people and the organizations from the projects, uh, they are waiting because they have to run uh, next year. Um, and there is also a risk of a further delay. So then it will take even longer until we can support people with disabilities and all um, the, the, the groups uh, that need support. Um, and there's also the risk of a complete failure of the negotiations, which is, which is uh, very risky. So um, I would like to point, however, um, that um, all of us, uh, so the negotiating team um, have been strongly keep uh, have strongly fighting to keep the co-financing rate for the help of the most deprived at at least 85 percent and the EP negotiation team made sure that co-financing for easy projects that foster social innovation and social experimentations can be raised to a maximum of 95 percent. But I um, can assure you, um, I'm also unhappy that we are constrained in many aspects during the negotiations uh, on the ESF plus, such as CPR and the MFF. Uh, but together with my colleagues, we will make sure that we will get the best results possible at this stage to help people in need and uh, to overcome this crisis together so that no one is left behind in the end. And uh, I also I can mention, if you allow, already the, <clears throat> the report uh, Mr. Guemes uh, has also mentioned uh, in the beginning. So last Thursday, Thursday on the International Day of People with Disabilities, the Petty Petition Committee has adopted its opinion to the report on the implement implementation of the UNCRPD. So in the original report, as well in our petitions committee opinion, the main concern was um, to bring people with disabilities into employment, fighting discrimination in application procedures, for example, and guaranteeing them reasonable accommodation in the workplace. So um, application procedures as uh, simple language or read aloud functions, for example. So I fully support all of these um, and they are represented in our opinion. And I have added two important additional points to our opinion that were missing before. So first I called for flexible parental leave for carers with the full guarantee to get back to their position afterwards. Secondly, I have added the dimension of education, which is also very important because while the needs of people with disabilities must be respected by employers, the access to quality jobs only works through education and this is often overlooked. So I have therefore included uh, that uh, also uh, programs as Erasmus Plus or the Youth Guarantee must be adapted to the more to make it make them more accessible to people with disabilities so that each and everyone in the European Union can reach their full potential.
many thanks, Mr. Middle, for I think uh, honest and, and clear clear response from from our side. I think the it's important that negotiations uh, arrive also uh, at the conclusion soon. I think there's a danger in postponing the negotiations too much uh, because that creates many uh, many issues in the long run for for our members. So uh, I think we're very much uh, open open to that. And for the other issues, I'm sure we can discuss it more in the in the weeks uh, to come. And um, in regard to your work on the the, the, uh, the Erasmus Plus and the Youth Guarantee, uh, indeed, they are, especially in the Youth Guarantee, um, we have some doubts over its effectiveness for uh, many uh, young people with, with disabilities. I know there are some programs around Europe which work, but we are currently have a study ongoing on its effectiveness in the social field and for people with disabilities. So we will make sure to share that with you uh, as soon as we have it to, to support you in, in, in that position. But, um, yes, please. <laughs> I think Very important. Before, hopefully, uh, before the end of the year, that, and that's, the, that's the objective. Um, now, I'd like to come maybe to Asel, my colleague. Uh, she's been working a bit on trying to um, gather ideas on the, on the social economy action plan that's coming up later this year. Uh, Asel, would you be able to give us a, a brief overview of, of some of the initial ideas we have for this European Union action plan for the social economy? Uh, yes, thank you, Tom. Uh, in terms of uh, the position of ESPD regarding the action plan for social economy, uh, I think one of the main messages that we would like to pass is uh, to uh, recognize and understand the diversity of uh, social economy and social economy actors, uh, especially with regard to uh, uh, social economy entities providing social uh, care and support uh, services. Uh, in this sense, it's important to understand that these kind of services that are targeted to uh, providing the uh, 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 supporting people in attaining their uh, human rights and social rights, uh, these kind of services should be delivered in close partnership with public authorities. And in this sense, it's important to uh, ensure their sustainability, but also be careful not to uh, make commercial viability uh, the main uh, reason for uh, existing, let's say, for these kind of uh, entities. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, sustainability uh, relates to the question of funding. And in this sense, uh, funding uh, of services uh, is of uh, vital importance. And uh, from the perspective of ESPD, it's important to look into uh, reserved contracts, uh, making sure that there is a, a lighter regime in terms of the uh, public procurement directive, as well as the um, state aid regulations. This also includes um, uh, VAT uh, regulations uh, concerning this uh, kind of social economy entities. Um, then, of course, uh, last but not least, EU budgets and making sure that there is uh, proper investments uh, in, uh, in the needs uh, of uh, social economy actors uh, providing support uh, to persons with disabilities. Uh, and in general, just the recognition, uh, the visibility and awareness of these kind of organizations having a, a, a clear definition and uh, frameworks uh, would be uh, very uh, much welcome. And also, uh, I think one thing I wanted to mention, of course, there are many other aspects, but these are the main uh, points uh, that I'm raising, uh, which includes also capacity building, capacity building in the sector, including technical, financial, and administrative support uh, to social economy uh, uh, organizations uh, working with persons with disabilities and run by persons with disabilities as well. Thank you. Thank you, Asel, for that overview. Um, I know Mr. Semedo has to leave soon, so would you like to say a few final remarks before we move on to Mr. Benifei? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for, for your interest and, and the input. I'm looking forward to uh, the report, uh, Thomas. Um, and uh, you, you can make sure that, um, although we are at the late stage of the negotiations on the ESF plus uh, we stick together as the uh, European Parliament and negotiation team so also hello uh, to to Brando uh, which uh, I will see uh, then soon uh, in the trilogue and um, yes uh, 
we will do, and I'm really um, committed to make the European Union more inclusive. And there is no place for discrimination in the European Union. And that's what I'm fighting for, equality, diversity, inclusion. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Semido, and, and good to see cooperation, cross-group cooperation on our, on our topics is crucial. So uh, I know Mr. Benifei also have to leave uh, quite quickly, so thank you for, for your patience. Uh, Mr. Benifei, uh, you will be working, I think, on the child guarantee uh, uh, right now and in the next few months. Could you give us a few words about the child guarantee and how it can help our, our services? You're muted, I will just unmute you. Yes, okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I hoped I could join a little earlier and listen to some of the discussions, but unfortunately, my flight was delayed and I, I arrived now in Brussels and I, I, we have a, a very, a very full days for the negotiations going on. And in fact, I have in a few minutes another meeting, but I want to um, uh, first of all, thank uh, EASPD for this uh, continuing work in these years of discussion on very important topics regarding social uh, rights and cohesion in, in the field that obviously is, is being uh, under uh, your, your activity in a very fruitful exchange uh, with us for, for a long time already. Um, and um, as you uh, we're introducing uh, Thomas. Uh, yes, I'm uh, uh, working on the child guarantee, and this is a very delicate moment for the finalization of the discussions. In fact, one of the last, if not the last, let's see, trilogue on the ESF Plus will take place on Thursday, dealing specifically with the hottest uh, knots of the deal to untangle, especially the part of the regulation on the thematic concentration, which include the proposed 5% for the fight against child poverty. This was the EP proposal that was endorsed by the Commission with their amended proposal of last May 2020. What can we expect for this round of negotiations? Council started from a very rigid position, rejecting an obligatory earmarking for the fight against child poverty. Their position, however, is opening up also thanks to the firm stance taken by us in the EP uh, negotiating team. We are confident that a margin for a satisfactory agreement can be reached. However, we must insist on the quality of such deal. Our priority is that we establish a strong European program, which is capable to reflect adequately the very complex reality in the member states when it comes to children and families at risk of poverty and social exclusion. We must make sure that in first instance, all member states are called upon to intervene in investing ESF plus resources to this specific objective, not only the countries in a more complicated socioeconomic situation. At the same time, we must make sure that the policies are capable to reach out the people who need to support the most, uh, making the instrument inclusive and able to grasp the multidimensional nature of these children needs, especially the most disadvantaged ones. Children with disabilities and their families in particular need to be granted with access to um, a, a quality, dedicated early childhood education and care services, fully complying with the CRPD and able in this way to, to foster a family-centered model of support. To make this happen, we need to achieve three different results. First, uh, adequate resources and programming obligation for all member states. This is what the ESF Plus is supposed to do, but we are also fighting for a dedicated child guarantee budget. Then a proper, uh, as a second point, the proper interconnection between national early childhood education and care policies and investments with the EU policy and investment framework, in particular by making the best use of the national recovery strategies in the recovery plan in the context of the European semester. A high quality and ambitious council recommendation establishing the child guarantee as a, as a third point. Uh, this is expected in the early 2021 and it will be the policy blueprint for the investment in children's policy in the EU in the upcoming seven years. So you see all these aspects are very important and for sure the child guarantee can be the first and crucial building block for putting into practice the European pillar of social rights in a very concrete manner. The involvement of local and regional actors, including the public authorities, as well as civil society, 
active in the field will be indispensable to map out adequately the local needs and ensure a proper implementation. I conclude here uh, my contribution and uh, I am looking forward to, uh, uh, to, to the um, inputs and elements that can come from this discussion. Um, as I said, unfortunately, I will need to leave. I, in this case, uh, I'm very happy always to participate and discuss with the EISPD that I want to thank again. But in this case, for the <laughs> ongoing situation, I will need to leave. But I hope that I can deliver <laughs> in these hours and in the next days on the objectives that I, I was talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Benefe. And you have, uh, I think, regard to the thematic concentration, you have our, our, our full support. Uh, really, we need this budget to make sure we can invest in, in children with disabilities and access to ECI. So thank you for your commitment there, and we will be in touch in the near future. Thank you very much for your work. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, so I think we heard from Mr. Benefe very clear commitments, not just so much on, let's say, the, the nice words and the nice principles, but actually talked in detail about specific EU programs and how much how they can lead to significant investment in the social field and for children. He mentioned the European Social Fund Plus, which we've heard several times today, which is really the, the main EU social program uh, that's going to be available for the next seven years. It will be around 100 billion euros. So uh, even one or two or three percentage of that is billions of euros worth of investment. So that's very important to take note of. He also mentioned the recovery and resilience facility. And, and this is what, what was mentioned at the beginning of this uh, program, which is the uh, EU's main uh, economic recovery investment plan uh, that will be uh, launched very soon. And that means um, the recovery and resilience facility is, is close to 700 billion euros worth of investment. So it's very important that I think ESPD is discussing with both its members, but also the European Union on that, to make sure that the the investment plans, the national investment plans for the use of this facility are, are, are used to support the development of services for uh, people with disabilities, and that includes the child guarantee. I just wanted to give uh, a quick, let's say, feedback on some of those policies to, to help uh, the participants who may not be experts on, on these specific policies, um, a bit of information about them and why they're so important. Um, but now I'd like to pass the floor to Karen Astiger, who's uh, works for Lebenshilfe in, in Austria, which is a family uh, service for people, children with disabilities, um, but she's also vice president of EASPD. Um, Brando mentioned the need to support children with disabilities in accessing early childhood intervention services. I think that's partly or very much closely linked to the activities that your organization does. Could you let us know about the situation in Austria and uh, various challenges that you may have? Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think both Mr. Benefe and Ms. Semedo gave uh, a bridge to, to, to topics I wanted to raise, also about the importance um, of support services for, for children for, for the entire life trajectory. But so coming back to early childhood intervention, fortunately, this is in, in my region a, a, a well-organized service. Um, so. I think the, the earlier support for children with disabilities and their families sets in, the better it is for child development and also for, for the potential of a life with equal opportunities. So for example, in my region, um, our early childhood intervention services, they have a close cooperation with neonatology uh, departments in hospitals. And, and this is one way of making sure that uh, families with children with disabilities or prematurely born children have, have early and easy access to support services, uh, which can both help the, the parents, but also working with the child as early as possible, um, ameliorates or, or even avoids certain impairments later in life. Uh, but very often we see that, that this is very difficult because of, of, of administrative burden uh, for families to get access to these services. And another problem that we also have in, in my region is that we have kind of a funding ceiling for, for early childhood intervention. So there are times when there are waiting lists and we know that especially early in life, this can have very detrimental effects when there are waiting lists and it limits or at least delays uh, accessibility of services. Uh, 
Yeah, also we have sometimes problem for, for recruiting staff, especially in rural areas, because we um, it's all uh, registered uh, professionals and they are highly trained and especially in rural areas, we sometimes have problems to find them, which uh, limits the amount of services we can provide. Um, yeah, well, in terms of early childhood intervention, I think these are the most important uh, issues I would like to raise, but I would like to make the connection also to services later in life of children with disabilities. Um, because, for example, my organization also provides um, different kinds of therapies, uh, it provides kindergarten services, inclusive kindergarten services, and we see a whole lot of challenges uh, that come uh, also later in life. So, for example, it's, it's difficult. Uh, our early intervention professionals have to stop supporting the families when the children are four years old. And many of them would need support from them, like when it comes to the transition from kindergarten to uh, school, for example. And um, also in Austria, the, the inclusiveness of education services, it's, it's not so fully guaranteed and it's especially challenging for children with high support needs. So by law, all children can attend the local kindergarten and the last two years before school are obligatory, but the reality is quite different. So uh, children with high support needs are often turned down. Uh, and their families are encouraged to ask for an exemption of the two obligatory kindergarten years, uh, which they can, uh, because they are not, uh, they don't feel capable uh, of dealing with the children with high support needs. And we also have uh, a similar situation in schools. Austria keeps up a parallel system of inclusive and segregated settings. And um, Again, especially child, uh, families of children with high support needs are discouraged to, to choose um, mainstream school. And although the authorities say they are implementing the UNCRPD by giving this choice, in fact, it's very often theoretical because the mainstream schools, they don't get the resources, they don't have the specialists, they are not adapted to, to meet the children's needs. And so most of the parents, especially from children with high support needs, are, are, are channeled towards the, the segregated settings. And I would like to come back to Mrs. Semedo now because she said that access to employment uh, can only work through quality education. And this is one of the most severe challenges for, for especially children and youth uh, with intellectual disability, which mostly have a career in, in, in special schools and for whom it is extremely hard to access the labor market afterwards. Also because transition services towards employment are, are they are not eligible for them because many of them are already labeled unable to work very early in life. And this includes, excludes them from these services. So actually the career is in, in, in special services and uh, it's very hard to break that routine and return to mainstream or to the employment market. So, so does that satisfy your question or you want me to elaborate more? I'm full of examples. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen may come back to, to that in, in, in other words, but it was quite interesting to see how a country which is uh, quite well off and quite has quite a well developed social support system still has many waiting lists related issues, especially in some regions, so you have regional differences, which you get, I think, in many countries in, in Europe. Uh, but you also have issues regarding um, policies that are meant to be in line with the UN Convention, but in fact don't lead to the, to the uh, the solutions that, that we really need and really identify and then the issue of inclusive education which is a major challenge i think in austria but many yeah. other issues as well and these are all three areas which the european social fund can play a big role in in, in tackling and finding solutions so when when um, mr benifei mentioned the need to make sure that all member states can benefit from or have to use this european social fund to specifically target intervention in this field uh, austria could use it for example to tackle some of these uh, issues uh, and it's not just the problems that you find in, in countries with less well developed social support uh, systems. So that's to, to bridge the link a bit. Um, 
We now have a final video from Mr. David Kaza from uh, Malta, another MEP from Malta. Uh, as you can see, it's an extremely busy time for members of the European Parliament right now because they're really negotiating the final details of all of these uh, programs. It's very positive, though, that they wanted to join us uh, during a very uh, difficult and complex time in their negotiations uh, to uh, present the views of, of, that they have on these important programs. And but I think we have a video from Mr. Kaza because he couldn't make it, but he wanted to join us anyway. I want to thank the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disability for organizing this important event. Um, policy makers who are active in this field should have one clear objective, ensuring that persons with disabilities are able to participate fully in our society. Service providers operating in this field play a vital role in this regard, and I see it as our job to provide support through the EU tools at our disposal. Of course, one of the most important European tools that can be used to achieve this objective is the European Social Fund Plus. I am the Parliament's rapporteur on this file, and negotiations with Council have been ongoing for over a year now. So far, together with the excellent negotiating team, we have done our best to improve this regulation, to make sure the needs of persons with disabilities are clear, and to encourage programs in this area. And now, we are at the most difficult stage of negotiations. The crux of this file are thematic concentrations. We want to ensure sufficient funding for actions enhancing social inclusion, for material deprivation, and for youth actions. A key priority for the European Parliament is the so-called child guarantee. The Parliament's position established a thematic concentration of 5% of the ESF Plus funds to fund education and social inclusion of children. We hope that such targeting will go a long way to support children in accessing social services. This could have a very big impact. The 5% for children is perhaps one of the most crucial and yet difficult aspects of the Parliament's position. The negotiating team is united on this front and we will do our very best to achieve results. I would like to thank once again the European organisations working to represent the needs of persons with disabilities. They are constructive and proactive and this will guide us in our work to achieve better results and for this I am grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaza, for that brief overview. So he is the main rapporteur for the European Social Fund Plus negotiations. Uh, we heard from several of the shadow rapporteurs uh, who were there to, to support him from, from different political uh, groups. And he's currently in the negotiations with the council, which is the member states. Um, and again, highlighting the important points that the parliament have to make where they're trying to protect um, the thematic concentrations and what the thematic concentrations mean is in fact that the uh, member states and the managing authorities who use these funds, that they have to use them to support specific targets and specific uh, to target specific um, types of intervention. Um, because if not, they could use it rather than using it on uh, whatever measures that they want to do on, it's to make sure that at least a certain amount of the amounts that's dedicated is set, for example, for uh, social inclusion measures or children with disabilities. And that's extremely positive but always quite difficult to keep them doing the negotiations with the uh, member states who uh, would prefer to use it however they uh, would like to. Um, maybe we could move to my colleague Assel regarding child guarantees. The child guarantees an upcoming um, EU policy that the Commission have promised to launch. And the objective is to improve, uh, tackle child poverty, but also improve access to services for children. And uh, in particular for children from particular uh, vulnerable groups and one of these vulnerable groups includes children with disabilities. So the aim of this child guarantee would to facilitate access to services, so early intervention services, for example, childcare services, kindergarten, etc. Also education services uh, for children with disabilities. And of course, we have been discussing with the EU institutions on some uh, key points that we would like to see. And Asel, if you would be able to present uh, briefly the, the major points that we would like to see in the child guarantee. Yes, Tom, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, indeed, 
Oh, I hear echo. Is it the case for you? Okay. Uh, so indeed, as Tom mentioned, uh, the child guarantee is uh, has a big potential to support uh, children with disabilities. And of course, they, from the position of EASPD, uh, we do call for uh, a specific um, support uh, in terms of access to services uh, for children with disabilities and their family. So uh, with a higher focus uh, on this target group. And uh, uh, in terms of services as well, focus on, should be on families. And this, uh, uh, in this sense, uh, quality family-centered uh, models of services need to be promoted. Uh, and of course, when we talk about services, we cannot uh, um, omit the topic of uh, staff uh, on workforce. Uh, so indeed, uh, better training uh, 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 is needed for staff, also in terms of recruitment of staff and retention of staff. Support for um, a comprehensive and integrated legal fr frameworks is vital uh, uh, for uh, supporting children with disabilities. Uh, in the, what we mean by this is that often uh, there are different uh, ministries uh, involved uh, or there is uh, unclear uh, which uh, authorities are responsible for different uh, aspects of support. And uh, for this, it is important that there is uh, more integration and uh, making sure that every uh, uh, there is coordination between different uh, actors uh, and legal frameworks. Uh, particular attention should be also paid to the transition periods because in terms of uh, early intervention, uh, for children with disabilities, it is important to uh, take into account the transitions uh, between uh, into education, into employment. Uh, so these aspects should not be uh, overlooked. Uh, but also uh, the child guarantee uh, should make sure that there are monitoring tools so that we see uh, where we are and what progress has been made because uh, without strong monitoring tools, it is uh, hard to uh, proceed further and make a true impact. So this in summary is the recommendations of uh, ESPD in terms of a child guarantee. Uh, and uh, a full paper was also produced uh, a few weeks ago, but the ASP, by ESPD and could be found on the website. Thank you very much, Asel, for those uh, overview and the clear uh, priorities that we see are, are, are should be absolutely put in place for the child guarantee to be um, effective. Uh, particularly important is the transitions, and I think Karen mentioned that earlier, the transitions between uh, early intervention, kindergarten, between education and the employment and the open labor market, uh, and the need to uh, invest in these areas. And Karen, a quick question for you. In Austria, would the child guarantee be useful? And if so, where should they prioritize? It certainly would be useful. I think this focus on, on, on children and children's services uh, is, is, is highly important. And as I pointed out, uh, as Although we have a highly uh, developed welfare system, we have quite a lot of challenges. And I would say a focus for, for a country like, like Austria uh, should be to really have a close look. I remember also that I read in the feasibility study on the child guarantee that the experts pointed out that, that especially in, in the higher developed welfare states, there is often a gap between the legal uh, uh, framework and the regulations and what is really put into practice. And I think uh, to really change something uh, in, in countries like ours, you, you, you must look at what is written and what is done in practice. And um, if I may um, formulate a, a focus that I find especially important, it's education. Inclusive education um, is a challenge in Austria, especially uh, to advance it further. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for a clear response. Child guarantee is needed everywhere, and uh, not just uh, in, in, the, in some countries, European countries, which some people and some member states are trying to push for. Um, so now is the time, I think, to conclude. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground over the last uh, two hours, uh, and I'm giving the, the opportunity and the chance to, to Jim Crow, our president, uh, to conclude 
uh, and to try and conclude in a few in a few words uh, everything that we've discussed today, which is a difficult task. Uh, difficult task. So good luck, Jim. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, a, a very difficult task. Uh, I think uh, this uh, webinar has taught me three things, and I, I trust that it's happened too for our participants. Firstly, that uh, our services are so important, and the pandemic demonstrated how weak they often are in terms of support and financial assistance and organization. You can add to that other factors like uh, skills in using digital uh, devices and connecting over social media. You can also add uh, whether the, their, our work as agencies is always recognized by the municipalities and governments that we uh, have to work with and to. That's the first thing. The second is that uh, uh, the European Union and the European Union institutions have a, a very important leadership role uh, above and beyond the member states. I think that came across loud and clear from the, our new UN rapporteur. Um, if the union can grapple with some of these issues about support for people with disabilities, then I think uh, that can have a global significance beyond the boundaries of the European Union. And I think that's reflected in the, in the, the diversity of the participants. The third thing it's taught me is that, um, is that when we look more closely at the European policies, European uh, Union policies, how many of them are at critical points at the moment and where we have to redouble our efforts to influence them. But we set up this webinar to talk about particularly about the disability strategy, the forthcoming strategy, to talk about the action plan for a social economy and employment services and the child guarantee. But uh, as soon as we got into the detail, we heard from colleagues, particularly the parliamentarians, about uh, things like ESF Plus, uh, from ASO about uh, public procurement uh, issues that, that have a bearing on us. And all of them seem to have a significant and potential, a significant impact on our services. And what we're able to do to support children and adults with disabilities. So it's so important that we engage. And, and as, as a third element, uh, an element within the third element is that is I'm really pleased uh, at the engagement we've managed to secure from parliamentarians. It's evident that they are very busy, uh, but a, a number of them have made time uh, to engage in this webinar today. Um, they are people we've often had connections with in ESPD, and we will continue uh, as, a, as a, an organization to try and promote links between you um, valuable members who provide services and the people who are responsible for such important decisions in Brussels. So I hope that you've enjoyed the webinar as much as I have and that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, take some heart and some comfort from the optimism really that the UN uh, rapporteur expressed in some respects about looking to see and discern the initiatives and innovations that are taking place, not just in, in Europe, but in other parts of the globe, and that we can build on them. So this has been a great start to our week of activities for social services. Uh, I think if you look, uh, Thomas has put a, a note about that in, our, in the chat box. Please go and look on our website. And if you haven't registered yet for a number of those events, please do so. So thank you, uh, participants, dear, dear participants, for taking part, but also thank you to our panelists and speakers and to my colleagues on the executive committee of ESPD and the staff team for putting such a, a very good uh, event together. Thank you very much. I wish you a, a good afternoon and evening, and hopefully we will reconnect, reconnect fairly soon.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to everyone.